Heard the news? It's good news. Makes a nice change, doesn't it? I think years ago I gave up listening to the news on telly because it was, it was all bad. They even gave up that little heartwarming thing at the end, you know, that one minute segment, not even one minute segment, 30 second segment, they have the news and then the sport, then the weather and then a warm fuzzy story. They haven't even got warm fuzzy stories anymore. But we have some good news, really good news. Zoom through uh, this particular passage that was just read for us in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. First of all, we see the importance of the gospel. It is important. You know, and the more you realise what it is, what it says, the more you realise just how important it is. So the first thing to note, the importance of the gospel. Back into our scripture, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. This is what it's about. We're not going to talk about other stuff, just what the gospel is. I passed on to you the most important fact of all the doctrines that could have been talked about, from all the, the ideas and the how-tos, all the thou shalt or thou shalt not, we just zero in on the most important facts. So what we're going to see is what I do with the gospel. Never mind what someone else does. Um, you can't live your life by wondering or worrying about how someone else is thinking or feeling or how they're responding. We can only control ourselves. What I do with the gospel is a few things. First of all, we need to receive it. The passage opens up in verse 1. The gospel which you received. It's all very well and good for the gospel to be in the Bible or preached from pulpits or uh, believed in lounge rooms or you know, walked around street corners. But it does no good unless we receive it. I was chatting with a guy through the week and talking about whether or not you need to believe. I said, on the cross, Jesus paid your ticket to get to heaven. He paid everybody. Everybody can go to heaven if they choose to. He's already bought a ticket for everybody. But it's no good having your ticket paid for if you don't get on the train. When it pulls out of the station, you're left behind. Jesus has paid for it. We need now to receive it, to do something with it. When you do, that's when it becomes good news for you. The gospel, still in verse 1, it says, on which you've taken your stand. And again, it's very well and good for the gospel to be in the Bible or somewhere else, but you've got to live it. It, it doesn't have its strength. It doesn't have resilience. It doesn't have its benefits unless we actually say, yes, this is for me. I'm going to take my stand on this. This is what is going to be the foundation for my life. And if you don't have a solid foundation, you won't have what it takes to cope with what life is going to throw at you, and it's going to throw some curly ones, nor will you have what it takes beyond life to stand for eternity. We have to make our stand on the gospel. It's who Jesus is where we need to choose him, say, yes, I am going to accept this as the basis for my life. We need to also hold firmly to this word. Other beliefs are worthless. All roads might lead to Rome, but not all roads lead to heaven. There are some wacko beliefs out there. There are some... I'll just eliminate this from the, uh, from the tape. There are some wacko Christians out there. But <clears throat> we're not amongst them because once we make our stand on the gospel and not on some strange belief system, then we've got some most important facts that anchor us to reality. And then we hang on to this because there'll be someone who comes along and says, Oh, you don't believe that, do you? <laughs> or, yeah, it might be good for you, but oh, it's not for me, it's for wusses. Yeah, don't, don't go that way. 
we hang on to it because it's the only thing that's going to last. All the other ideas that are floating around in the world are ultimately worthless. They won't take us through life or to heaven. That's what we do with the gospel. Now, what's God going to do with the gospel? Is it that important that he does something with it? You ready to do this? I want everyone to follow the little icons. By the gospel, woohoo, you are saved. That's what God is using. There is nothing else. There is no other way to get to heaven. There is no other way to get through life. God saves us with the gospel, the good news about Jesus. That's the plan. Plan A, plan B, plan C, all the way down to plan Z. It's to save us using the gospel. There is no other way. There is no other path. He does that. And that's why elsewhere in scripture it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And the reason why I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to do what? To save. Save who? To save everyone who believes. Now belief is not just, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea, but for those who make their stand on the gospel, to make it the foundation of their lives. That's why it's the power of God because it gives us the stability that life requires. And then from the importance of the gospel to the authority that the gospel has, it, it speaks with a strength. The fact that I passed on to you this is not someone making up some great idea. Oh, look, I've had this dream. I've had this brilliant thought. Uh, I, I uh, better not let this get on the tape either. This is, I, have, I do my best thinking in the shower. Uh, <clears throat> the writing notes to myself is, is terrible, but that's where it all comes. None of that. It's not, I've had this brainwave, this rush of blood to the head. No. It's something that's been passed on down through centuries, through millennia. We're not reinventing anything. It's rock solid and it's been proved. And what is it? As the scripture declares. As the scripture declares. We're not basing this on ourselves, but on something that God has said and done and proved with the evidence again and again. That's a bit circular. We can do better than that. Imagine this conversation. You're bound to bump into somebody who will say to you, the Bible is full of mistakes and contradictions. You can't fight someone like that. Don't bother. But here's a suggestion. Say, how interesting. I've been looking for mistakes and contradictions in the Bible. I'm so glad you're here. And I've got a Bible with me. Please show me one of the, even one of these mistakes or contradictions. You'll find the conversation will take a very quick change of direction. But you can do better than that. We're not out to put people down. Our role, the way the gospel changes us, is it allows us to be positive towards people. And so you can say, the Bible does say God loves you. And that's not a mistake. The Bible has got something good to say, something authoritative to say, something that is required of us. And it's all about how God really wants, longs for the very, very best for us and for our lives. I'm writing a book. I've been working on it for, well, quite a long while now. I've you know, been working on it for years. And it's a book about all of the mistakes and contradictions that are in the Bible. And <clears throat> I've been working, you know, for years and years, I've been collecting them all. And I'm up to page one, Chapter 1, paragraph 1, sentence 1, word 1, and it hasn't been written yet. 
Now, seriously, I have been looking for any errors, any mistakes, any contradictions. And the reason why I can stand up before you and talk about the authority of the Bible is because I went looking, seriously looking. There is nothing that is contradictory. Everything holds together. It's true. It's factual. It's not some crazy idea. And, and maybe that's why it's so difficult to read sometimes. You, know, you start reading the Bible from page one. Genesis is pretty interesting. Exodus, whoa, that's fascinating. Leviticus, oh, most people bomb out about that point uh, because a lot of rules and regulations and, and how to deal with mildew in your house. Look, it, it, it meant something at the time. But it, yeah, actually, it still means something today because there are lessons for us to learn. But it's all true. And it's a record of history. It's a record of God doing his thing. There are no mistakes. There are no contradictions. It is utterly reliable. And that's why we can make our stand on it. That's why we hold on to it. That's why we can be saved because of it. And so elsewhere in Scripture, we're way over near the back cover of your Bible. You've got a little book by Peter. We did not follow cunningly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now that's important. It's the fact that this is a first-hand account that gives it its authority. It's written by people who were there, for those who saw it, heard it, participated in it. The only difference you might get to that is something like Luke's Gospel. Uh, Luke wasn't part of what happened where Jesus was. He was living in a different country altogether, in fact. So in his case, he came back and he interviewed the eyewitnesses and recorded what they said. You'll find that in the opening paragraph of Luke's Gospel where he explains. It wasn't me who saw it, but here's the first-hand eyewitness account of those who did. So the Bible has an authority that makes it trustworthy and reliable and true. And that's why we lock ourselves in to this is what the Bible says. Because we can trust it. All right. Let's not get too sidetracked. Come back to the gospel, the content of the gospel. What is the gospel that's making such a difference in our lives? There are lots of things that could be the gospel because they're good, but not necessarily. Uh, what's the gospel, by the way, means? Do you, do you need three guesses to, <laughs> to, to work out what gospel means? Means literally good message we, we in English put it across as good news God loves me is that the gospel? no it's good news but it's not the good news how about my home is now guaranteed to be in heaven is that good news? well yes it is good news but it's not the good news it's not the gospel I can have inner peace and joy is that good news? Absolutely, it's good news, but it's not the good news. It's not the gospel. These things, as good as they are, are spin-offs that result from accepting the gospel, taking your stand on the gospel and holding firmly to the gospel. I passed on to you the most important facts I had received. As he said, this is what the gospel is going to be. And this is it. Christ died for our sins, as the scripture declares. He was brought back to life on the third day, as the scripture declares. That is as simple as it gets. Jesus died for sin and rose again. That is the heart of the gospel. All the other good benefits flow on, therefore, as a result. The gospel is Christ died for our sins and he came back to life. And that's the return to life is the guarantee and the assurance that God had done everything that he needed to do. So what then is the purpose of the gospel? 
He died for our sins. He didn't have to die. There was no reason for Jesus to die. Certainly no reason to be crucified. But he did it for us. In fact, he did it for every single person in the whole world. As the only perfect person who had ever lived, he was perfectly qualified to become the perfect sacrifice and take everybody's sins so that no one gets left out. It was absolutely awful on the cross and that's what we were thinking about on Good Friday. He died for a purpose and the purpose was our sins. We get a a glimpse of how bad it must have been a bit further on in Scripture, the the next book in fact. God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin. <clears throat> Could you imagine that? He had never had a first-hand experience of what sin was. He was perfectly pure in everything that he said and did. He was surrounded by sin, but he himself had no first-hand knowledge of sin. And what happened? He became sin, all the sin of the world. Every wrong thing that every person had ever done got dumped into him on the cross. We could never imagine, never imagine how bad that must have been. For a purpose. Look at the other half of the sentence. So that, here's the rationale, the reason, the outcome. We might become the righteousness of God in him. He takes all our wrong, all our mistakes, all our errors, all our sins, all our guilt and all our punishment, all our negative consequences go to him and he gives us in return the righteousness of God. That's what is our ticket into heaven. The fact that we have the very nature of God now comes and dwells within us. That's what makes it such good news. Let me bombard you with a little bit of theology. Yeah. Don't be scared. It's not that hard. The power of the gospel. How we get from where we were to be saved, to get to where we're going. That's not so hard so far, is it? Yeah, we did rocket science on, on Good Friday. Yeah, it's not as bad as, ro- as that. Reconciliation. It sounds big and scary, but it's how God gets us from death to life. Redemption. How God gets us out of our sin and sin out of us into his family. Propitiation. You probably never use that in a sentence. But it's how the wrath of God is turned aside and now we have peace with God so we've got here reconciliations the language of the courtroom the sentence of death was upon us but we get the pardon to life redemption is the language of family and relationships we were cut off but now we've been brought into the family Propitiation, it's the language of the invisible, the emotional, the, the stuff that you can't see or touch, from anger into peace. In every possible way, God used the cross and Jesus' death to solve our problems and make life better and eternity guaranteed. We've got so much that's given to us purely as gift out of the gospel. And so finally, so what? Let's live out the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, don't bother going anywhere else, everything else, is worthless. So what's the gospel? Well, in here is both the gospel and its consequences for us. What's the gospel? The gospel is the good news that God became man 
in Christ Jesus. This is God himself comes and does for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died. He did it in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he is God the Son and offering to us, as a gift, salvation. How do you get it? How do you take on board the gospel and make it yours? How do you get all the benefits of the gospel that God wants to give to us? It's a two-step thing. Repent, thank up to this point, I got it wrong and I'm deliberately going to turn away from that and now my stand will be on the gospel, not on these other things that have occupied my heart, my mind, my life. And now I'm going to take a step, a deliberate step, and choose Jesus is my Lord. The Bible is my guide. A new outlook, a new direction in my life is the gospel taking hold of me and making me a different person. It's the gospel that makes the difference, the good news about Jesus. Then what do we do? We go out and live it. We live the change. We are now different people, different from the inside out because repentance says, not that way, belief is now this way this is where I'm going and God then gives you the resources to make a difference the gospel changes what do you think the gospel might change it changes everything about you everything about your destination and everything about how you get there let me pray Father thank you for the gospel thank you for Jesus Thank you for what you've done for us that long time ago. Thank you for its impact on our lives today. Thank you that we are being changed. Oh Lord, now give us everything that we do need. The, the strength, the patience, the, the wisdom to be able to choose to live out what you're doing in our lives so that we truly can become different people better people, Christ-like people, so that the world in which we live, we can make a better place. For we ask in his name. Amen.